Um, I wanted to take a, a, a slight twist on the, um, the topic for today and look at nature as nation and to um, ask a bit about whether one of the reasons we're not making much headway in changing our relationships with the life systems of the earth um, is that we still see ourselves in a colonial relationship to it. Um, our language, our syntax, our whole terms of reference um, with regard to uh, the world beyond us are those of occupation. And so I want to ask whether we can go using, again, the literary analogy, can we go post-colonial? Um, is it possible for, for literate Western humans um, to respect the autonomy and agendas of what David Abraham called the more than human world? Or are even writers genetically complicit with forest burners and farmers? And I wanted just to, just to chat about this really in, in a much more microscopic context um, than Gretel, um, to talk about writing in this particular corner of the world, um, in East Anglia, um, which is both one of the m most degraded landscapes in Western Europe um, because of its agriculture, and also in other parts, uh, one of the wildest, but in both um, it is Britain's front line <coughs> in climate change. Um, the threat or opportunity of inundation um, isn't even in the future here, it's actually happening at the moment. As so often, I suppose, the, 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 uh, the journey to ask that kind of question um, was entangled with my own life. Um, r rather unusually for these days, um, I lived in the same house for 50 years, um, in the same landscape, in the Chiltern Hills, uh, the wooded uh, chalk hills uh, northwest of London. And being a rather solitary um, young man, um, I persuaded myself that I knew them very well, that I put down roots, that I was myself a kind of indigent. Um, I knew every niche and cranny, and I suppose I saw myself as being um, assimilated into the company of Beechwood familiars. Um, I was one with the beech martin and the ghost orchid. But of course, when um, I actually look back at my, my, my writings from that period of my life, um, the artful uh, metaphors of changing beech woods into aquatic systems, um, the arrogance of my knowledge of shortcuts, um, I was taking possession of the landscape. It wasn't taking possession of me. And um, it wasn't until um, a, I was ill with depression, which seems to be de rigueur for writers in this, this field these days, um, and moved away, um, that I began to see that the, the rooted relationship I thought I had with the place was actually much more complicated than that, and may not have been a, a terribly uh, good thing. What shocked me um, about moving from a habitat that I felt welded to um, was how easily I did it. And it shocked my friends as well. I wasn't bothered by regret or homesickness, and I didn't have the slightest difficulty in going back either. And the assumption that one's true roots are singular and exclusive didn't seem to work with me. But the smoothness of, of what, what I mean, in some ways, ought to have been a rite of passage made me think again about the nature of the relationship writers have with their native places. Um, our uh, Patron here, uh, East, East Anglia's great writer Ronald Blythe, um, once wondered whether landscape enters the bloodstream with the milk. Quite probably, but what aspects of it and what do they become sucked in like this and then regurgitated? Does the grasping nature of rootedness mean that the home scene is in some way appropriated? Is capturing a landscape a more literal process than we imagine? Roots can obviously become ruts, but can they also become snares for the land itself? What I found um, coming to an entirely different landscape from um, those deeply historically rooted um, introspective beechwoods of the Chilterns into the big open flat wetlands um, of East Anglia was a, a, an enormous sense of liberation. Um, 
The landscape here, I felt, couldn't be pinned down, couldn't be appropriated in the same way, even though large areas of it already had been appropriated. Um, farming, but the wet bits, the coasts, the broads. Um, I found the landscape there elusive and also mercurial. Um, I'd moved into a house which was in the uh, River Waveney Valley, and about a week after I'd gone there, um, there was a major flood, and um, the view from my bedroom window, which had been an ordinary English fieldscape the night before, um, was now a lake. And uh, I remember that Sunday um, driving down to, uh, to the Fen through um, a blizzard of, of wind-thrown uh, birds and the little dikes at the edge of the road um, overflowing, um, uh, driving a sort of glacial edge of sand um, across the road. And I found it um, exhorting, and I thought that this was like a second spring. Um, the landscape was being reopened, remade. And I suppose that was part of what helped make me well, that if the landscape um, could change that much, had such possibilities, um, then they were there for my life as well. What this did to me as a writer um, was to consider an alternative to the idea, that arrogant idea, um, of taking possession of a landscape, of appropriating it to your own needs and dreams, of, and of putting down obstinate and needy roots. What instead if you actually made the effort to let it take possession of you? Possession of you. What happens at the desk, of course, happens even more in the world outside. Um, textual enclosure is an echo of real enclosure. It's significant that um, even so-called nature conservation is taught now in the language of estate agents and property dealers. Nature is referred to by most agencies now as capital. At best, we describe ourselves as stewards, um, or if we want to sound more efficient, as managers. As uh, Gillian said, that language legitimizes behavior, um, gives it status and power. And I wonder how much we've thought about how the vocabulary, um, even the grammar of our discourse about the natural world, has locked us into, again as I said, a kind of colonial relationship with it. I remember uh, very early on in, in terms of, of giving public speaking about 30 years ago, um, being taken aside by a very patient feminist ecologist after a talk I'd given, and being uh, presented with a, a short quarter of an hour seminar about how to talk about he and she um, without using those words. 